Welcome to another episode of Give Me an Answer. I am here with Cliff, and we have the absolute joy today to have a conversation with Dr. John Lennox, Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at Oxford University and renowned Christian thinker and author of a ton of books. We have enjoyed those thoroughly, but his latest is 2084 on artificial intelligence. So check it out. Fantastic book. You can get it at 2084book.com website, not just Amazon. So you can check it out on that website. Dr. Lennox, to start us off here, why write this book? Why now? And is there some type of response that you'd like Christians to have to AI? Well, that's three questions in one. <laughs> so let's have a look at them. Why I wrote the book is because I have always been interested in two very big questions. First of all, the status of the universe as a mathematician and scientist and Christian, that's obviously been uh, an immediate concern and, and interest. But secondly, is perhaps an even more important question, which is the status of human life. Is it made in the image of God or not? And what are the consequences of taking either of those two views? And of course, I've been interested for many years in the nature of human beings, especially when it comes to technologists and scientists beginning to try to alter what a human being is. Now, I got interested in that topic through the writings of C.S. Lewis many years ago, through two very important books, in my view, The Abolition of Man and That Hideous Strength. And in those books, Lewis points out that if scientists actually get to the stage where they can alter the actual fundamentals of what it means to be human, they end up producing not human beings, but artifacts. And he makes a chilling statement that the final triumph of science will be the abolition of man. And so it has interested me. And of course, from a biblical perspective, the whole question of the status of human beings is immensely important. People wish to know who they are. And in more recent years, there's been a great deal of speculation about altering humanity through various forms of artificial intelligence. And I was actually asked to give a lecture for Christian leaders on this topic. And as I began to research it, I saw that this is something that really needs a book. And hence the book 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity, which you have in your hand, I'm delighted to see. Thank you. Dr. Lennox, I really appreciated your book on ethics. What are some of your personal ethical struggles? How do you struggle through ethics in your own life? Well, there are various levels. Ethical behavior is has to do with the righteous person and of course, the Lord Jesus calls us to be righteous. Indeed, one of his fundamental commands, which it is so important we take seriously in all avenues of life, is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I think the second part of that statement explains the first. In other words, when people say, what does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? It's talking about God's government. Mm -hmm. It's talking about his lordship of life. And it's explained by saying that the area where that development takes place is in the moral area, which is fundamental to the status of human beings as moral beings, which, by the way, is an additional answer to the first question, why I wrote this book, because it has to do with morality and ethics and values. And, of course, the basic struggle in contemporary world is, of course, not to give in to the subjectivism and relativism that really says, well, do your own thing. Uh, morals are relative. There's no ultimate accountability and so on. Now, of course, as a Christian, 
I do believe that there is an absolute morality and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But there is such pressure in our society to cut corners and not to be righteous in various areas that none of us are exempt from temptation, as scripture says, let him that thinks he stands take heed uh, lest he falls. And, you know, I was given a bit of wisdom many years ago on this. I used to think you'd solve all these problems by the time you were 34, and then you'd really live. And someone said to me, he said, you've got it all wrong, you know. Solving the problems is living. And that's a very different perspective. And I find it very helpful to share that with people, that solving these problems, moral, ethical, spiritual, all kinds of problems we meet in life and business and professional life is living. And because it is living, God is interested in those details and we can experience God's guidance and government in those things, which means finally the marvelous fact that God isn't only interested in what we do on a Sunday and a Wednesday evening if we're very keen, but he's interested in the whole of life because seeking his government is not simply sending emails with verses from the Bible every morning to our employees. It isn't that at all. It's seeking God's government and all the big decisions we have to make and the way we run our lives and the, and the way we, in which we care for others, those we employ and the colleagues with whom we work. Dr. Lennox, I love in your new book, 2084, how you talk about, you quote kind of John Gray some, and it's fascinating how a lot of Christian thinkers quote him. So he's written Straw Dogs, his latest is Seven Types of Atheism. Help us in understanding what in the world exactly is atheism? Is it simply a lack of belief in God? Is it a full worldview? You think of Ravi Zacharias's book in terms of Jesus among secular gods. So why did you use John Gray in your new book? And how can we think deeper through atheism? Well, again, you're asking five questions at a time. <laughs> And for an old man like me, it's hard to remember them all. So you, you'll have to, you'll have We're to on the clock. We've got to hit you hard. If here. I forget some of them. But John Gray is interesting as an atheist thinker. Now, let's take the concept of atheism. The word atheos simply means no God. But people make a mistake, and you get it with Dawkins and many others, and they say, what's the big deal? I simply don't believe in God full stop. But that's never true. Uh, Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, doesn't simply say on page one, there is no God. And that's the end of the book. There are over 400 pages giving the flip side of it, which, as you rightly say, is a worldview. We tend to call the worldview naturalism or materialism. In other words, uh, atheism has entailments. It never sits in a, a vacuum because you can always ask a person who says there is no God. Uh, you can ask them, what do you believe there is? What is your understanding of reality? And then out comes a whole atheistic philosophy of naturalism. So it is very important that we realize that our atheist friends buy into a belief system. They are people of faith. Every bit as much as everybody else is a person of faith. And that is hugely important because you see, many atheists taking the view you just mentioned, atheism just means there's no God, so what? They think that they are not people of faith. Why? because they've redefined faith to mean believing something where there's no evidence for it. Now, that isn't faith. Faith comes from the Latin fides, and you're talking there about fidelity and evidence base. You're foolish to believe things if there's no evidence. They redefine faith as what most people would call blind faith. And then they want to say, we are not people of blind faith. But neither are Christian believers. They're not people of blind faith. Faith in Christ is evidence-based. That's why we've got a New Testament full of evidences that uh, Jesus is the Son of God, that he rose from the dead and so on. So that 
I use John Gray because he, uh, although he's uh, <laughs> he he's quite a, what we call a misanthrope. He, he's he's a bit on the miserable side of things, and um, he gets challenged for that. But what is interesting is that he takes atheism to its logical consequences, a bit like Nietzsche did, uh, and therefore. Uh, I, I find that quite useful to, to point out to people. That's great. Dr. Lennox, you have a friendship with Richard Dawkins who wrote The God Delusion. You've debated him. What are What is the strongest point, positive point, that Richard Dawkins make, and what is his weakest point? Well, I, I've got to correct you slightly there. I, I would, <laughs> though I'd like to have a friendship with him, uh -huh. uh, there's no evidence of that, really. As right. you see, if you watch any any of our debates, right, I must be very honest. I'm not impressed with him intellectually at all. I think he has um, degenerated over the years, and I suppose one could say that the strongest point that any atheist has, let alone Dawkins, mm -hmm. is of course the problem of evil. And he uses that, and many other people use that. But I don't find his arguments particularly convincing. And mm -hmm. the book, The God Delusion, has been actually cri severely criticized, not just by Christian believers like me, but by atheists. Yes. Because his logic fails him. Yes. So I'm not impressed not that that proves anything right but i do feel his arguments are easy to see through and uh -huh. when you base an entire book more or less and as its central argument uh -huh. you use the idea that if you believe in god as creator then you'll have to explain who created the creator uh -huh. uh, that is astonishingly childish and uh, to get that from a fellow professor at Oxford just amazed me. I, I used to get it from school kids. But it's so easy to see what's wrong with that argument. If you ask who created God, you're assuming that God was created. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the central claim of the Bible is God is eternal. So Dawkins' question doesn't even apply. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Again, what can I say? It is just so foolish. Yes. But it hardly is is hardly worth discussion. Mm -hmm. I think is one of your best friends, Peter Atkins. Ah, the great chemist. He's, well, <laughs> he's close I, to I laugh, right? I laugh because if you watch Peter in action, uh, you'd think he was tearing me to pieces, which he tries to do publicly. There's a wonderful, well, there are two out there on, the, on YouTube. There's dueling professors. And then there's the recent dialogue I had with him, moderated by Justin Brierley at the University of Southampton, parts of which are quite hilarious because he completely loses the plot. But privately, I get on with Peter very well. And, of course, he supplied the title for 2084, for which I'm thankful. As you may have noticed, I acknowledge him at the beginning of it. Help us. I, something that you said that really helped me in my processing through discussions with atheists. You said, if we simply debate atheists from kind of the intellectual cerebral side, it almost favors them because Christianity needs to also feel real. And kind of with that, I hear, and I know Cliff does on a regular basis today in our debates, you have to have this type of extraordinary evidence for a supernatural claim. So two questions there. Why did you make that comment of almost it favors the atheist if it's simply an intellectual and there's not the feelings and the emotions behind it. And then also, why do atheists so frequently say you need extraordinary evidence for a supernatural claim? Well, I'm, I, I don't uh, identify myself with having ever said that. Well, mm -hmm. where did you read that? I thought it was in one of your debates in the last two no, years. No, what I may well have yeah. said is that atheism tends to deal only with one aspect of a huge issue. 
that rational arguments are as important to me as to the atheist. But we have got two sides to our brain and uh, we have got an analytical scientific side that uh, takes things apart, but we've also got an integrative side. And for me, the humanities are very important. That is the expressions of human relationships. And the point I make there is that God is not merely a theory, but a person. And therefore, in relating to God, you're not just relating to a set of propositions in the abstract, you're relating to a person. And therefore, the categories of personality and personhood apply to that kind of discussion, and we must admit them. And of course, secondly, that um, in the big questions of life, for example, the one I just mentioned, the problem of suffering, it's one thing to have a set of intellectual answers mm -hmm. when you're watching suffering. It's another thing to be experiencing it and requiring pastoral care and emotional answers and all this kind of thing. And we can see those two aspects very clearly in the present coronavirus pandemic. Now, your second question was, you're going to have to try to do them one at a time. What was the second question? <laughs> So often now I'll hear atheists say, and as you know, atheists now have tons of YouTube channels where they're really attacking Christians. And it's kind of the new atheism, so very different from the Nietzschean and John Gray type of atheism that you referred to. And I'll frequently hear them use the term, you Christians need an, a level of extraordinary evidence for a supernatural claim. And it sounds very subjective to me, but how would you respond to that? Well, of course, it's a very easy thing to say. And I'd reply to them, you would need to give me extraordinary evidence why you trust your brain as your mind when it's the end product of a mindless set of unguided processes. In other words, I want to challenge them on the same basis. Uh, there's no content in that kind of a question. You Christians have to. Uh, there's no have to about it. As Christians, what we are called upon to do is to put the message, God's word, right out into the public space and uh, do it credibly and allow people to respond. Telling me what I have to do, I might as well say exactly the same thing to them. You have to give extraordinary evidence that atheism is true. But where does that get you? Because the interesting thing is, the people that talk loudest about wanting evidence are the people who are least interested in it. Mm -hmm. I find that with Dawkins, for example. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lennox, I really appreciate your study in the psychological advantages of belief in God. And I appreciated your reference to Professor Andrew Sims. I think of the president, former president of the Royal Society of Psychiatry. So, Bottom line for you, what are the psychological advantages of belief in God? When we talk about advantages and, and things like that, well, we need to be to a certain extent careful because advantages don't prove the truth of Christianity. But on the other hand, if Christianity is true, they are exactly what you would expect. And psychologically the central thing in psychology is personality we are persons made in the image of god and that is the central statement it seems to me i was watching jordan peterson recently in his fascinating lectures on genesis and when he came to the statement that god made human beings in his own image he said that is the cornerstone of civilization, and we neglect it at our peril. So here in one statement that says we are made in God's image, he's a person, we're persons, he's rational, we're rational, he's full of love and all kinds of different psychological characteristics, and he's made us in his own image, that imparts to every human being, whether they believe in God or not, incidentally, 
and infinite value and dignity. And that is hugely important. And when we lose that, then we descend into subjectivism and we end up in the world that we see all around us today where people don't know who they are because they've got no transcendent reference point and they're just moved about by every wave of subjective belief and that will only last a short time because that kind of thing opens the world up to domination by power blocks and I fear it could easily land, certainly has already landed in certain parts of the world, in totalitarian uh, subjugation of populations. So it spells freedom. And uh, of course, the founders of America, they realized this to a very large extent, that the doctrine of creation was absolutely fundamental to the dignity of man. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in connection with your question, I, I feel as Christians, we ought to be louder than we are in proclaiming the legacy that Christianity has left in our society, giving us our values, producing hospitals, producing hospices, universities, governmental structures, human rights legislation, perhaps above all, because it goes back to being made in the image of God. And therefore, it seems to me to be very important to stress that. It's not simply that it gives an advantage. The advantage comes because this is true. Mm -hmm. And it's very important, it seems to me, that we keep hammering and not, and I know you don't mean this, but not Christianity is good for you, but mm -hmm. Christianity is the truth. And therefore, it is good for you because mm -hmm. it brings it in, into contact, brings you into contact with the creator who made you. Thank you, Dr. Lennox. Has science buried God? No. A lot of people <laughs> think it has. Why do you say no? Well, a lot of people think it has because they haven't thought about it at all. And of course, you're referring to the subtitle of my book, um, God's yeah. Undertaker, Science Very God, which incidentally, I am massively rewriting. Good. And I hope it will come out within about a year, substantially revised. And I hope being much more interesting because it was the first book of this type I wrote and it cost me agony for a number of years. And I oh. hope I've learned a bit since then. <laughs> But fundamentally, when people ask that question, I, I say, well, if it's true, it's very odd because science, modern science, was essentially produced by people who believed in God. Mm -hmm. And I discover many people don't realize that legacy of Christianity and history, that the pioneers of modern science like Galileo and Kepler and Newton Clark Maxwell, Babbage, all of these people believed in God. And I think C.S. Lewis put his finger on it when he wrote long ago, men became scientific because they expected law and nature, and they expected law and nature because they believed in the legislator. In other words, <laughs> without faith in uh, an intelligent God, who ordered his universe, in my view, you've got no reason to believe that the universe is rationally intelligible. Now, it seems to me, therefore, it's not a question of how science buried God, but it is a very real fact for which there's strong evidence that atheism buries science. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different matter. Perhaps I should write a book entitled Atheism Buries Science. That would get people <laughs> reading. Since you cracked the door for Jordan Peterson here, why does Jordan Peterson, why is he so critical of colleges and universities in this day and age? You as a very successful mathematics professor for so many years, why, why does he go there? Well, I have not heard him going there, so you'd have to tell me. But what I can imagine is that 
in many colleges and universities, sadly, we've lost the fundamental purpose of a university. Mm. And we've turned some of our universities into safe spaces that are uh, policed by political correctness where people can't discuss any ideas sensibly without offending somebody else. Now, if that's what he's saying, of course, he's absolutely right to say it. And it's a very serious business to turn what was originally set up to promote uh, free speech and discussion and learning to turn it into the exact opposite, a tool for surveillance and essentially oppression. And if that's what he's doing, well, then I agree with him. But since I don't know what he's doing, you'll have to speak for him. I think that was largely it, yeah, amongst other things. Um, what's the connection you see? Help us with your new book, Artificial Intelligence 2084. Why, why is there evidence for the existence of God, especially a personal God, perhaps, with the brain-mind connection? Help, help a lot of Christians understand that a little bit more. Well, that's a huge question, and it's a very important question. I think that the confusion that exists today, atheism stand, is that uh, the mind is the brain, and everything is reducible to physics and chemistry. Now, I think that cannot be true because it's self-contradictory and massively illogical. If it were true, we wouldn't know it. And my former teacher of quantum mechanics, Professor Sir John Polkinghorne, points this out, that if you reduce uh, meaning and thought to the firing of synapses, then, well, he says, we all know that cannot possibly be true because it empties the world of meaning. And that's one of my biggest uh, objections to atheism. I think it's, it's perfectly obvious from a simple point of view, but a very practical one, that if you've got sufficiently sophisticated uh, equipment, like PET scanners and this kind of thing, you can tell something about what's in my brain. You cannot use that equipment to tell me what's in my mind. Hmm. I can't tell you what's in my brain. I can tell you what's in my mind. And that distinguishes between the brain story and the mind story. The second point is that we haven't a clue what consciousness is, but we do realize that at the very least, we are capable of communicating thought and thought conveys information and information is not a material quantity. And that from my mind spend, spells the end of materialism immediately and a good deal of naturalism that this is only, well, C.S. Lewis puts it very well, and he, he points out that he didn't say it this way, but I'll say it this way. You don't need to go to miracles to see evidence of the supernatural because human rationality is supernatural. If it was purely natural, uh, again, you're into the problem of physicalism very rapidly. So that's the way I would begin to approach that, that uh, what scripture has to say. You see, the bottom line for a lot of atheism is what we call physicalism, everything reduced to physics and chemistry. And therefore, everything else, including brain and mind, are derivative from physics and chemistry and the laws of nature wherever they came from. The biblical worldview is the exact opposite of that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Mind is the prior thing, the mind of God, and matter, mass and energy are derivative. It's the exact opposite of the atheist worldview. Mm. And I think our task, and my task certainly, is to try to get across that the biblical worldview is infinitely to be preferred if you're a scientist, mm. than the atheist worldview, because at least it has got massive explanatory power. Dr. Lennox, you in England and we in the United States are surrounded by moral relativists. Why are you not a moral relativist? 
Well, moral relativism is absurd because, and I mean that, uh, <laughs> let me tell you a little story. I, I was once sitting having lunch in my college and there was an author beside me and his book was on the table. And um, I asked him what was this book was about. He was a visitor, clearly. And he said, well, uh, I'm a literary critic. This book explains that there is no such thing as authorial intention. And I said, well, if that's true, I'm not going to read it. And he was really upset. <laughs> and he said, why not? Well, I said, if there's no such thing as authorial intention, then you're talking nonsense to me saying that you intended it to teach that. And what you find with moral relativism and truth relativism is always the same. All morals are relative, but you have to accept that as an absolute truth. Mm -hmm. The person who's speaking accepts themselves. And, of course, that's simply a logical contradiction and cannot be so. And also, moral relativism can be judged by its consequences. And... You say we're surrounded by them. I want to argue that deep down, mm -hmm. everyone virtually believes that in absolute morality. You go to a moral relativist and hit them in the head with your fist, and I bet they say to you, you shouldn't do that. And you say, well, that's my own uh, conviction. I love hitting people. Why shouldn't I? And once they say you shouldn't, they are expecting you to believe in the same kind of standard they do. In other words, one that transcends both of you. And therefore, they're not moral relatives at all. Uh, a friend of mine who's a brilliant Christian apologist in Germany once said, people are usually only uh, relativists in areas that they consider unimportant. Mm -hmm. Well put. Thank you. How do you think through, okay, so now we're going broad. Because you've written so broadly, we don't have time to hit a bunch of these topics, but a couple of them. One, I really enjoyed your recent book on predestination and free will. Maybe without going too deeply, how do you think through predestination, mm -hmm. the atheist perspective on perhaps free will, and then the Christian understanding of free will? It just... In, I oversee small groups at our church. I oversee some some men's groups as well, and this topic comes up pretty frequently. What's just what's a fair balance in thinking through it? Well, that's why I wrote the book, and the book is is substantial for the simple reason that often discussions on this becomes throwing verses at, of scripture at each other. And the conversation goes like, look, these verses teach God's sovereignty. But what about these verses? Oh, yes, but what about these? And so on. And you get absolutely nowhere, which is why I thought I'll sit down and look at every possible thing I can find. There's no simplistic way of approaching this, but there's a powerful moral argument that cuts to the heart of it, and it's this. God, we are told, is going to judge people on whether they have believed in the Lord Jesus or not. If they are not free and do not have the capacity to do that, God is then going to judge people for not doing what they could not do. And that, to my mind, clearly turns God into a moral monster. That cannot be true. Now, Scripture clearly puts attention on this. It teaches that God is sovereign. It also teaches that humans are responsible. Now, we have the problem of teasing that out. No doubt from God's perspective, it's easy. And one day I hope to learn how easy it is. But we must not push one side to such an extent that it contradicts the other. And it seems to me that's a perfectly biblical position, and yet people insist on doing it. Now, of course, out in the atheist world, uh, determinism is very popular. But uh, again, it, it leads to all kinds of difficulties, particularly in a world in which we both experience morality and love. 
because in a deterministic world, neither of those two things, well, they can't happen, but they don't mean anything. A robot can't love you. And so it seems to me that there are powerful arguments for going with both sides of what the biblic, the Bible teaches and being humble enough to realize that we don't understand it all. And I suspect, but I can't prove it, that a lot of our problems arise out of anthropomorphizing God and imagining that his relationship with time is the same as ours. But our Lord pointed out in that famous statement, before Abraham was, I am, that there's a very different relationship between him and time as uh, us and time. Because the big difficulty for many people, they cannot imagine God knowing something in advance and not causing it. Mm -hmm. But I leave it there. Thank you, Dr. Lennox. As you look at the world today, what are the biggest ethical decisions that we as human beings have to make? And how would you make them? Well, there are huge ethical decisions in every area of life. I pointed out some of them in 2084, and I wrote that book because I, I felt that Christianity's got something to say here. There are huge ethical decisions in connection with our children and our grandchildren, what we're doing to the world. And it's pretty obvious that we're doing some dreadful things to the world. There are massive ethical decisions in the communication. Uh, take the present instance of COVID-19. The way in which information was spread at the beginning was atrocious. And therefore, what can we do about it? Well, all we can do about it is what we individually can do. I think one of the dangers in the contemporary world is that many, particularly young people, but not only, they get involved in huge global issues about which they individually can do nothing. But when it comes to moral behavior mm -hmm. and not bullying people at school, and not stabbing them in the suburbs of London or shooting them in the in the suburbs of New York, that's a very different matter. And it seems to me that we can easily become a nation of big issues that are way beyond our control. And instead of getting on with what we can do, and if we're Christians and pastors and all this kind of thing, we can certainly influence people's thinking. But that's a huge topic yeah. that, uh, as you very well know, would take hours to, to explain. But there are some huge things. There's the, well, in America at the moment, you see what's happening with ethnic minorities. We see what's happening with scarcity of resources, with loss of jobs, with all this kind of stuff. And people are despairing, and somehow we've got to bring a credible hope into the situation. Thank you, sir. All right, maybe last question here. What in the world did, drew you to Joseph in writing a book about Joseph? And obviously much more of a devotional book that's been used in many churches now. And you, we view you as a modern day C.S. Lewis. And I love you quote him so frequently. <laughs> I know C.S. Lewis didn't really go to church though, if I'm right. Oh, he and went to church. I, I can show you the church he went to and he used to irritate people massively by coming in late. And he had a stick and it would tap on the stone floor of the church and people got so mad with him that <laughs> once during a church service, somebody sneaked in, took his stick, took it outside and put a rubber ferule on the bottom of it so <laughs> that it wouldn't scrape. He certainly, he went to an Anglican church in, in Headington. But you say, what in the world drew me to Joseph? Well, I suppose the reason was that I had written a book on Daniel because I could see that that dealt with huge issues of values, of the significance of life, and above all, of witnessing in a hostile environment, which in many ways is very similar to our own, 
The story of Joseph, by contrast, is a family story. We know nothing of the family of Daniel, but we do about Joseph. And for many years, I've been interested in the book of Genesis and the way it develops. And of course, Jacob's family was dysfunctional. It was in a mess. And the whole business of Joseph and his suffering at the hands of his brothers is really the first serious treatment of unfairness and suffering in the biblical record, if you think about it. And his life raises so many issues that face us today. Attitudes of family, hatred, unfairness in work, favoritism in the family, work ethic. What do we do with power when we get it? How do we deal with sexual temptation? Uh, and all this kind of thing. And it struck me that it would be very good as a balance to Daniel to write a book like this that is intensely practical. And I've been very encouraged, as you say, that many churches have adopted this book and are using it. Excellent. Well, we have run out of time. Dr. Lennox, thank you so much for this awesome interview. Don't forget 2084, his great new book. Uh, check it out online. We also had talked about Joseph, his book on pre uh, predestination. We've talked about his book on Genesis as well. There's endless amounts. He speaks so broadly to so many different issues. We see there's so many different folks who came in live today from Sri Lanka, New Mexico, uh, New Zealand, many other places. So thank you for tuning in. If it's your first time, hit the subscribe button. And we'd love for you to become part of our our friends, our friend group here at Give Me an Answer. So thanks again, Dr. Lennox. This is great. Thank well, you, Dr. Thank, Lennox. Thank you so much for having me on. I'd just like to remind people looking in that I do have my own website, johnlennox.org, where you'll find lots of this stuff. But thank you very much for a very interesting set of father and son questions. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dr. Lennox.